fellow snows, hoes, ugly blokes, and millennial jokes, and welcome to the Bastards of Gaming Podcast, episode number three. I'm your host with the most, Zeiser, joined by my co-host, the maple syrup to my French toast, the Michael Schofield to my Lincoln Burroughs, Center. Oh, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Not fucking you, because you had to start shit last week with the pizza fucking topping. Hey, look, look here. Now, now, whoever eats fucking pineapple on a pizza is an insane person. Like, it doesn't make sense. I don't know who came up with this or why people keep doing it or why it's a thing, but you're a fucking insane person to eat pineapple on a pizza. But this whole fucking discussion, like, I almost walked away from this podcast last week. We're two podcasts in, and and... And some fucking person asks us about pineapple on a pizza, and that was well, it. You're, I mean, well, you're the one that got upset about it. You, you know, it's it's pretty common that people don't like that on a pizza. Well, you're asking me, that, you're asking me, like, why am I having fruit on a pizza and tomatoes a fruit? Yeah, do you do you put fucking grapes on a pizza? Do you put some no. mango on there? Yeah, of course you don't. So but why if put it was good, on if it? it was good, you would. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, it's it's, it's just dumb. I mean, you know, I've had it. I've tried it. Hey, if there was a pizza laying around and that was the only thing in front of me and there was pineapple on it, okay, I would eat it. But, you know, no one's going to order that themselves. That's I just do. dumb. I, okay, let's just... Let's, let's, let's just go. move let's on. Move this on. is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, well, we got some more good feedback uh, last week from our show. Uh, hundreds more people checking it out. Uh, there's more positive reaction. We got more engagement uh, across all social media platforms. Uh, you know, I I uh, had this guy reach out to me. His name was uh, his name was Terry. He's a he's a bodybuilder. He's he's been trying to trying to work out lately, and uh, he's been trying to reach reach this uh, this goal of lifting, powerlifting, deadlifting, whatever it is, uh, like four hundred pounds. He just he hasn't been able to get there lately, and uh, he he told me he's like, you know, I put on the podcast last week. That music kicked in, and I heard your voice, and I grabbed that bar and i lifted it and so terry if you're out there you're listening good job uh you know i'm glad we could help you reach your goal i'm glad you could you know we could change your life and that's you know that's what we're here for is to change people's lives good job terry yeah good job terry so uh what about you hurting hurting good things yeah just looking at all the stats and everything people are just downloading this thing like hotcakes hot all right so we're uh, we're gonna change up the format just a little bit this week uh, we're going to do the topic of the week up front. Our topic of the week this week is what turns you off from playing, purchasing, or completing a video game. Uh, and before we get to the rest of the show, I just want to say up front and let everyone know that uh, this podcast is free and uh, available on all major platforms like iTunes and Spotify, Stitcher, Google Music, and tons more. Uh, just search for Bastards of Gaming. And if there's a platform that you would like us on that we're not on, uh, just let us know. And we'll try to work that out for you. Um, we're not going to do too much. Or we're not going to do news this week, actually. Um, but there's something uh, you wanted to say about that, Cynthia? Yeah, so the only thing I wanted to mention, because I just want to go over the news just quickly, because nothing really happened this week, is it was awesome that Nintendo announced a whole bunch of uh, new things coming this year, like the Zelda reboot and uh, some Dragon Quest and Fire Emblem announcements. That, and, I, and I'm into those games, so I, I was happy about that. Um, but it's there's this guy, I think he's on Waypoint. His name is Harlan Papayo, and I think he honestly works the Nintendo beat, and he just shits all over all the news that comes out all the time. And like I, I think I think you can agree, Waypoint just has these types of people there where they're just like shitting on things and causing trouble and whatever. It's just, I don't know, whatever. And like, he just shit all over. He just said like, nobody cares about these games. Nobody cares about like the Zelda reboot for one of the, like, it's like a remake basically and all this stuff. Although he did say that the, the Tetris battle Royale game is pretty stupid. And I think most people would agree that it is. Um, and he also said that the Super Mario Maker 2 is just Nintendo's sad way of getting players to make the game for them, which which it got me to laugh. But everything else that this this Harlan Papayo guy said was just he's just ripping into it. And I'm just surprised that they even uh, publish these things on their on their website with this. 
Yeah, I'm I'm kind of familiar with uh, Waypoint. Uh, I, I read some of their stuff. I'm not familiar with this uh, Harlan guy you're talking about, but from what uh, from what you're telling me, I'm, I might have to check him out. It seemed like I'd probably agree with most of what he says based on what you told me. Yeah, well, whatever. go check him out, Harlan Papayo. It, I don't even know if that's his real fucking name, but whatever. Uh, there it is. It just it just struck me as weird that this guy works the beat and uh, he just shit talks it because usually people. They have a little more decorum when they're talking about whatever they're covering as a journalist. So, yeah, you, you probably will like him. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge Nintendo fan, so if he's shitting on Nintendo, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can get on board with the Harlan train. <laughs> All right, so you want to move into our topic of the week here? Yeah, let's do the topic of the week. Oh, yeah. So before we get started with the topic of the week, we want to make sure all you snows out there are checking us out on social media. So make sure you stay up to date and engage with us by liking our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Bastards of Gaming. Rewatch clips and past episodes on our YouTube channel by searching for Bastards of Gaming and make sure you subscribe as well. Lastly, we would love it if you could leave us some honest reviews on our Facebook ratings page or the podcast platform you choose to listen to us on. Those reviews will go a long way in helping us build this podcast and community. All right, topic of the week time. All right, yeah, let's get into the topic of the week. So the topic of the week this week is what turns you off from playing, purchasing, or completing a video game? And uh, I'll just start out by saying anything called Crackdown. Uh, That's kind of a huge turnoff for me. (laughs) What about you? (laughs) Crackdown doesn't turn me off. There's some good times to be had in it. Um, But but for sure, a crappy game is is definitely going to turn you off. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? So we've had some people on Facebook that were engaging with us and letting us know uh, some of their like pet peeves and things that turn them right off from picking a game up. Nadine from Facebook, she says, uh, being bombarded with microtransaction shilling when purchases add nothing to the gameplay but bright colors to look at. Uh, what happened to just unlocking stuff by playing the game? Um, so me personally, I don't really have too many problems with microtransactions and stuff like that. I don't. I usually just ignore almost all of that. Uh, the only time I really engage with that stuff is if uh, I feel like it's a game that's worthy of more of my money. If it's a game I'd be spending a lot of time with, a lot of time playing. Um, cause like I said, I think if you were to, you know, completely strip out microtransactions from a lot of games, I feel like the price of the game would probably go up. I think this is just a, a way to sort of offset the cost of most video games. Cause you can have, you know, your wells out there or your people with a lot more money and, you know, they can, they can buy this stuff if they want it. Uh, and you know, that, that will offset the cost of, you know, games being, you know, $60, which is, you know, games prices haven't really changed that much, uh, you know, relative to inflation. And, you know, as we've progressed, uh, for the last couple console generations. So I feel like that's just a way to keep costs down. Uh, I don't think that I've ever quit playing a game. Uh, just because of microtransactions and stuff like that. Like like I said, most of the time I, I usually just ignore it. Uh, but what are your feelings on it? I don't think the microtransactions really offset. I feel like it's really on top of the game. Uh, because if you, I, I think if you look at something like Fortnite, which is free, it, it probably, if you break it down to how much is spent per person, um, it probably does come close or maybe over the like $60 mark, like it could be way over the $60 mark. So people are spending like a hundred dollars per person on these games. I don't know. I don't have the numbers, but I, I just feel like, like you're buying the game for 60 bucks in Canada. It's 80 basically. And then you have these like get to the end game quicker or get the advantage type of transactions. microtransactions, yeah, well, And like, it, it's on top. That's on top. It's almost like the season pass, but it's not included in it. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't buy that stuff. So I don't really care. But it is annoying yeah, I mean, to have that shit in yeah. there. Yeah, I don't buy it either. But, it, it, you know, it depends. Like, you know, I'm, I'm playing some Apex Legends right now, and that's a free-to-play game. So, I mean, the microtransactions have to exist for that game to exist. Sure. Um, and, you know, but it's different in a $60 game. Like, you know, when whenever Battlefront 2 came out, and then they had all this extra bullshit on top of it. So, it just depends. It's just a case-by-case yeah. uh, situation. But uh, what else uh, turns you off from completing a game or playing it so for me the number one and i really thought about this the number one reason why i usually put a game down is because i have too many choices and 
when you have like four games and maybe three or two of them are in the wing waiting and you're playing one of them that's just like dragging on or it's not capturing your attention, I just want to start that honeymoon phase over again where I'm starting a new game, learning it and just getting that like new experience in me. So I, I have a hard time sticking with a game if I have too many games on the fly. It's almost like Netflix where you're searching through Netflix for half an hour before you find something to actually watch. Uh, like you spend so much time just perusing and adding things to your list and you don't actually go to your list to play anything. You're just looking for something new again. And the Game Pass, I, I'd like to say the Game Pass does that. It doesn't because I've played a lot of those games already. But the Game Pass kind of lends itself to that where you could download a game and be like, nah, this game's crap after an hour and then try something yeah, else and then try another that's one. De- that's definitely a contributing factor is like how much you actually invested in it. You know, if you if you bought a $60 game brand new, then you're probably going to be more inclined to play through the whole thing versus sure. something you just got for free off Game Pass or whatever. Yeah. And that's yeah, what we I, used to do I, when we were younger. Like you got a game and that was it. <laughs> you yeah. Know, you couldn't get anything else. Yeah. See, I usually don't. I usually won't start a game if I don't think I'm going to play through all of it or most of it. Um, so I usually only stuff that I will stop and start like that will be like smaller games. Like we, like you're saying this stuff that's like free on game pass where I don't, I don't have any real investment in it, but if it's like a big triple a game, you know, like there's a, I, I've been, I've been trying to get to metal gear solid five for like years now, <laughs> but I just can't ever get to it because I'm like, I know if I start that game, I have to set aside, you know, a couple months. And so, you know, there just keeps being other games that come out that get in the way. And so it's just like one of those things where I don't want to start it unless I can really invest the time into it. Uh, So yeah, sometimes I just, uh, yeah, I I won't play games unless I know that I can really get through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was going to talk about is uh, a thing that used to turn me off from games and make me not want to play. And when I was younger was uh, just games being too difficult you know, games being too hard, uh, stuff like that. It doesn't really uh, factor in as much now. I mean, I don't. I typically don't play a ton of hard games now, just because I don't have time to like grind or die over and over again. But when I was young, I would, uh, uh, you know, if a if a game was pushing back against me too much, because I didn't, I didn't really take games seriously in, in my younger years. So a game being difficult would certainly push me away. What about you? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I. I'm a little more lenient. Like I'll take the punishment a bit and I'll try it. Um, if it's really abusive, I'll definitely walk away from it. Um, but that was something a good friend of mine, Aaron Randall said on Facebook as well. He said that if it's, if it's aggressively difficult, uh, and he used the example of Mario galaxy two, um, he said like he wants a challenge, but he doesn't want to do the same level 50 times over and over and uh, it just keep dying and, and it's just super repetitive and boring because obviously you're not like you're not able to, to rise to the challenge and do whatever it is the game's trying to get you to do. So it's it's frustrating. I, like the frustration, definitely. That'll, that'll turn you off for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like he like he said, uh, you know, at least give me a chance to say right before the part that I'm going to die at. I had that. Uh, I guess the most recent example of this for me, a game that kind of turned me off and made me want to stop playing it uh and i i, ne- I actually never went back and beat it was uh bloodborne mm-hmm. um i'm not really into those kind of games like the dark soulsy stuff but i wanted to play one and give it an honest go and so i bought that game and i, I was enjoying it for the most part uh but uh, one mechanic in that was they had these blood vials that you used to uh you know get your health back and so you would go to a boss fight, and if you died a few times, you would you know, be using your blood vials in the middle of the boss fight, and eventually you would run out of them. And so if you wanted more, you would have to go back and grind and kill enemies in, in hopes that they would drop them. And then on top of that, you would, uh, if you died, you still had to run back to the boss. So if you weren't very good at the game, like me, because I'm not very good at those sort of third person character action games like that like the devil may cries or the dark souls or that kind of thing if you're not very good at those then the game really punishes you for you know not being able to get through a, a boss encounter on the first few runs and then making you go back and grind and run to the boss and sometimes you get hit by some enemies on the way to the boss and so that was just a thing that kind of pushed me pushed me away from that game and made me not want to play it because i'm like well i just want to keep 
you know, going head on into the boss here until I beat him. I don't want to have to go back and grind and like run to the boss every time. I feel like I could have beat him faster if I could have just, you know, had the opportunity to start right there and just fight him and have all my blood vials that I had before I started the boss fight the first time. Yeah, well, thank God for save points and checkpoints and stuff in games because in like the retro games, when you had to start the whole level over and it was hard to even get to where you got to before you died, like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so to kind of add more to that too is the last game I played that I, I haven't touched since I put it down is Divinity Original Sin 2. So that game's a, like a strategy RPG where you move around and you have so many uh, move spaces and stuff. So it's another like XCOM type RPG game. It's great and it's fun and there's so much depth to it. Um, but I put 64 hours into it and on the 65th hour when I'm just about to get like like finish the game basically in the last act the game just became super hard and the game's hard to begin with like it's it's fair but it's difficult but once I got to that point it was like holy fuck like what happened it was like it cranked up the difficulty like three levels and I was already playing on normal as it is and it was just so hard that I haven't been able to beat it and I want to beat it because I like completing things but it's just I don't know, like that's horrible design to just all of a sudden make it so difficult. And it's not like you can grind in that game either to to level up more because there's only a finite amount of enemies and items and stuff like that. So when you get to that point, you're screwed. You have to get into those fights and figure out how to actually beat it. And it's either yeah. I'm, I'm too stupid to figure out the tactics for this thing after 64 hours. I thought I had, I thought I had the game under wraps, but... It just, it turned me right off. I just don't have the energy after that amount of time. Yeah, that that uh, brought to mind another example of this uh, that I hadn't even thought of until just now. But I played uh, Final Fantasy XV a couple years ago. And uh, I think it was maybe even last year. But I got all the way through that. I played like maybe 80-something hours of that game. I don't even remember. And I got to the end, and it was one of those things where, because if I'm playing a you know JRPG or something like that, like I want to grind a lot before I hit the end game, before I go to the last boss and all that. And they just throw you into this super difficult area where the enemies were just like kicking the shit out of me. And like, I couldn't just go back out of that and grind. And so I ended up just bailing on the game right at the end after putting all this time into it, just like mm. you said on, on divinity. Cause I was just like, well, you're forcing me down this little path here and you're not letting me grind if I want to. And so I'm like, well, I guess I'm, I guess I'm out of this game now. That sucks because I really liked Final Fantasy fifteen. I like some things about it, but uh, overall, it was it was kind of disappointing. I can understand that. I I had the Royal Edition, so I had like the all the DLC and the alternate ending thing, and <laughs> I just played the game not realizing I actually picked the shit ending that everyone complained about, <laughs> and I just beat the game, and I'm like, oh well, whatever. Like I'm not going back to see it, um, but I only put like. 65 hours into it to beat it so like i can i get it i didn't do all the dungeons and stuff but yeah there were parts where you just got whooped you got whooped pretty good and yeah it kind of kind of brings up another point like when games are too long and you're burnt out from it obviously you're going to put it down and it's unfortunate because you've invested so many hours in this game to get to that point and you didn't see the ending so like Divinity's yeah. one for me, Final Fantasy's one for you. So if you're putting like 50, 60, 70 hours into it, uh, that's that's a long time. And if you haven't beaten it yet, that sucks because it's like it's like Witcher 3 too. Like there's so much to do and it gets to the point where you either have to just get back to the story instead of dicking around on the outside or just just burn through it, like not even watch like watch what people say, not even listen to the dialogue, just burn through it and get it over and done with at some point because you put like two hundred hours into it, like Fallout or Skyrim. Like it yeah, just... well, those those are the those are examples I was going to make just because uh, like I, every time I get a new Bethesda game, like a Skyrim or something like that, a Fallout, like I'm loving it, loving it, loving it, and then I get over to like uh, over a hundred hours, and then I just reach a point. It like it's usually around. And it's, it's, this sounds pretty insane, but usually around the 150 hour mark in one of Jeez. those games where I just completely lose all. I'm just like, all right, it's time to get to the end game and beat this. Like, it, it's just like an immediate drop off and fun for me where it's like, I've already, I've already spent a ton of time in this world, in this game. It's, it's time for it to be over. So I end up 
blazing through the end of like fallout four or something like that. Cause I'm like, I just need to be done with this. And like, yeah, when you, when you put too much time into it, you know, you, you want to see, you want to see it to the end, but also you get, you can burn yourself out if you don't manage that. Like, um, you know, Ubisoft games are notorious for this. Um, yeah. Where like I love the shit out of Ghost Recon Wildlands, and me and my friend played it on and off for like a year, and that game has so much fucking content in it that like I think we only ended up maybe beating like a third of that game, and that was spending over a hundred hours in it. And I mean, I like these big games with all this content, but you know, a- after you play like a bunch of them back to back, you know, you can get burned out on it. So, do uh, you have any other examples of that? I. <laughs> Definitely Ubisoft is a huge perpetrator of all the side mission collectible whatever stuff. Like that stuff is fine if it has a point or purpose. Like if you collect uh, 10 feathers in Assassin's Creed, it gives you something. You know what I mean? But a lot of the time it's just there and it doesn't really do anything. Crackdown has that same thing where you're collecting all these orbs to increase your agility and stuff like that. And there's hidden orbs and there's like 250 hidden orbs alone just for the hidden orbs and it's like why would you do all of that why would you get them all because there's an achievement for it like you don't actually need it it's just it's it's filler it's for it's a way to get people to keep playing your game for like the people who have ocd and need to collect absolutely everything and that's that, that overwhelmingness stuff it's a distraction and it makes me not want to beat the game like we're talking about because i have a tendency to not follow the story for a long time i just go and do other stuff i go look around i go turn rocks over i level up a bit i do the side missions and eventually you get burnt out like we're saying like it's just it's too much when you probably should just stick to the main story and enjoy the game as a whole and i actually did that with red dead i didn't do everything on the outside of it and yeah, I, know, I was I know gonna you, mention that too yeah you i know you did a ton you've played way more hours of that game than i have and like, yes, you can fall into that game and just become like a cowboy, basically. Just be fully immersed. There's so much to do. The world feels alive. But it's just, <laughs> I got yeah, I, I got stuff I to do. Yeah, I didn't, because I, I, I 100%ed um, Red Dead 1. And so when I got the second game, I was like, I'm going to 100% this. And then when I got in there and saw everything you needed to do, because I 100 percented the first game in like five days, uh, which is a reasonable. Yeah, I did. I mean, I didn't get all the achievements because a lot of them were tied to the multiplayer stuff. But as far as the single player stuff, I beat everything in that game in like five days. Granted, I didn't have a job at the time, so I had a lot more free time on my hands. But uh, yeah, with the Red Dead 2, once I saw the amount of stuff you had to do to 100 percent that game, I was like, no, thank you. (laughs) <laughs> and so I didn't even see all of the content in that. There's so much stuff in that game. And I put like over 200 hours in the single player alone. So, and I didn't even see anything. So that's a, that's a huge ask. And, you know, maybe I'll come back to it as, at some point, but yeah, Red Dead is a, is definitely a recent example of a game that had just maybe a little bit too much content. And it's sad because they put so much care into it. You know what I mean? Like there's just, yeah. It, it's an experience and it's almost like if you played it again, you would see completely different stuff, which you would. And when you've posted stuff and other, other uh, posts that have been up, been put up by our friends, like I didn't see that. I didn't even come across that. Like things happen at different times of the day. And like even the, the randomness of things that could happen while you're on the same mission, like it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot there and it's just, it's too much. It's just too much. Yeah, the the amount of stuff that I keep seeing that people are finding in that game is is absurd. Um, but Joseph um, Mannion from Facebook he says, uh, "Bad gameplay, uh, un unentertaining story, and not enough carrots uh, is something that will turn him off Carrot, from yeah, playing a get, game." I get carrots. I get that. Yeah. Do you do you put them on your pizza? Do you like um, them on a the pizza? No, I might blend it into the sauce though. Mm, okay but for me um yeah bad gameplay is actually not that big of a turnoff like i'm weird when it comes to like video games like i'm i'm oddly satisfied with whatever you give me for the most part as long as it works like i can play most games and find some fun in it i I just inherently like what a video game is and uh i mean the gameplay would have to be pretty bad like 
Crackdown 3, when we were playing that last night, is a pretty good example of like everything about that game, gameplay wise, is pretty bad. And but you know, I was still I was still engaged with it. Uh, so it's not that's like kind of far down on my list of things that turn me off from from playing a game. I guess it's all dependent on you know what type of genre you're talking about. If you're talking about a platformer and the mechanics are super bad and you can't make jumps and you know, be all precise and yeah, but like if it's like a shooter and it's not the best like shooting mechanics, I'm still satisfied with just the fact that I can shoot people and you know, so it, it's all dependent on the uh, on the on the game or the genre. Uh, what do you think about bad gameplay? I I agree with you. Like there's there's different calibers of bad games. There's games that are mechanically shit and they're frustrating and are just slapped together. They're like bargain bin titles, but there's also games that were, that are like, they're still kind of crap, but there's funny things that can happen from it. It's entertaining. Like there's glitches and it, like the coding is bad or the textures are popping or things are falling through the the levels and stuff. So like, like you see that a lot of, a lot of that stuff with AAA games like Ubisoft and all the Assassin's Creed games. Like there's a lot of hilarious glitches and stupid things that happen that are, that are, that are hilarious. And, yeah, I mean, and, sometimes a bad game is is like the is like the fun. <laughs> like yeah, I said that's with Crackdown, it. It, it, it's kind of fun, and it's fun when things break. Yeah, I know it, what you're saying. In Crackdown's defense, we played multiplayer together, and I have about like seven hours of single player. Multiplayer is busted because the lag is outrageous, and I don't know if it's like bad network code or whatever. But when you play single player, like it's it's the game's fine. But in our multiplayer game, like it was busted to shit. Like the physics were crazy, and it, it must it might be like there's just too much going on. Like there's too many yeah, explosions well, and things flying around that can't handle it. Whereas yeah, like, well, if, open world open world games tend to have that problem online because sure. it's 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 taken into account always like cars driving, yeah. and pedestrians and explosions. Yeah, sure. Okay, so like Red Dead kind of has that, but the game's slower. And GTA Online had that to an extent, but it, it was it's not as bad as what Crackdown was last night. Like, Crackdown's yeah. pretty bad. Like, where it slowed down and shit. We'll talk about that after, but, like, yeah, I don't know. There's fun to be had in Crackdown, but it is, like, a poorly made game a bit. And I'm sure there's lots of other examples of that, where it's, like, a guilty pleasure. Like, you play this 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 game because it's just so funny and ridiculous. Um, the, the thing I'm thinking about right now is, like, Gang Beasts. You know, like I, that's, that's a weird example because the game, what it is for people who don't know what it is, it's, it's like a four player brawler. And basically your character is this like silly putty type character and you're grabbing other people and trying to throw them off the level and the different, and the levels have like different elements to them so some have like grinders and you throw people in the grinder and some of them are on top of a skyscraper and you throw them throw them through the railings off the building and stuff but the controls are fucked like they're, yeah, they're there's purposely a, there's fucked. a few yeah there's a few games like that where the the purpose actually is to have bad controls like yeah. um like that game and then uh i've never played it but i've watched people play it octodad have you ever seen that yeah like Manuel the, Samuel's another one. Yeah, yeah. we talk about. But but it's that's more leaning into the comedy aspect of it. It's like intentionally bad for sure. the sake of sure. But it, having it's, that as a mechanic. But it, it it speaks to what we're talking about. People like that clunky, shitty gameplay because it leads to comedy. So yeah, that's, and, it's and, weird and that people, there's a genre for that. Yeah, and people play all those early access games where they're not finished and they're broken. So I mean, there's a there's a certain level of charm to that. I mean. You know, people love PUBG, even though it was kind of a, a janky mess and still is. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, people don't I feel like a majority of people will kind of look over that sometimes for certain games. But he said uh, he was talking about unentertaining story. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't uh, the story is almost the least important thing. Now, if I'm, you know, playing a telltale game or something like that, which uh, rest in peace, you know, <laughs> obviously the, the story is the point. But uh, for any other game, I mean. The stories are generally bad in most video games anyway, and if it's a big, huge open world game and I'm running off doing other things, I lose the plot anyway. I, I just don't really, I don't really care. I mean, certainly a good story elevates a game, uh, but it's not, <clears throat> it's not a factor that deters me from playing a game. Usually, what about you? 
I do play a lot of games for the story. That's why I like RPGs. Um, I have been turned off by story. It's not so much the story. It's it's just shit writing and uninteresting characters. Like if I can't get invested with at least one character, I don't really want to play the game. And like if the gameplay's there, I might power through it. But even if the gameplay was there and it's just so boring and I don't care what happens next, I probably will shut it off. Yeah. And so then the last point he made was the, uh, you know, a, a, the digital carrot on the stick, as it were, in a game. Um, for me, <clears throat> for me, that doesn't factor in too much. I mean, I, I do look at things like, uh, like, you know, Apex Legends right now. And sure, you're leveling up and you're, you're getting the currency, you know, to buy stuff in the store, but it's just like, it's just other skins for guns and stuff like that. It's not really uh, a nice carrot on the stick for me personally, just to have different emotes and, you know, uh, my gun's green now or whatever it is, uh, different poses for your character and stuff like that. That's not enough of a carrot on the stick for me. Um, so, you know, even though I like playing Apex Legends for the gameplay and the experience of it, um, you know, I, I don't like their sort of carrots on a stick, as it were. And maybe I would want to play more if I felt like I was kind of investing into it more because you're not leveling up any characters, per se. The characters are the characters. But, um, but yeah, I have, I mean, I probably have bounced off some games where, you know, maybe if there was a carrot on the stick in there, um, I would, you know, like even Destiny 1 was kind of a thing where, like, I was always chasing something. And uh, once I started playing that game more casually in Destiny 2, where I wasn't like trying to keep up with the dailies and grinding for everything all the time, and, and I didn't really go for that carrot on the stick, I found that I did stop uh, stop playing or start playing less of it. Um, so, you know, it, it can factor in. Uh, how, how much does that factor in for you? Uh, it depends on what type of game it is. Like the carrot could literally literally be anything. It could be the story. It could be the gameplay it could be unlockables. It could be something to get that you can brag about and show off. I don't know. It could be a lot of things. It, it just depends. It, like the, To me, it doesn't really matter. Like If the game is there, I'm fine with it. It doesn't matter what's going to happen next. Um, but for sure, like carrots. It, we're kinda, it's funny that we're talking about like this thing as like a carrot. It's probably had some other name. But um, like I'd say like in Diablo 3 or any action RPG, like the carrot is opening that next chest, killing that elite boss to see what he drops. That's the carrot. The carrot is getting the next weapon that'll make you a little bit stronger. And that's addictive. So that carrot could actually be a smart thing for developers to keep throwing into their games because it it grabs that addictive behavior that humans have for things. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly ruined Magnum's life with Destiny. That's for sure. <laughs> Speaking of Magnum, <laughs> he actually wrote in and said that the most important thing for him buying a game is whether or not he can play with friends. And I like I don't 100 yeah. percent agree. Like I I don't mind single player games, but for sure I would buy a game if everyone else was buying it and I had no interest in it. Yeah, like when I bought uh, Fallout seventy six and then none of you guys played with me. <laughs> I it's played like it. That. I played it for like a couple hours and it was garbage. Come on. We're going to have to go back to that because I bought the fucking collector's edition, all that oh shit, and all I got God. was a fucking helmet. You should have uh, sold it but immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's so cool. I don't want to I don't want to give it away. But yeah, I mean, I have bought, I mean, I definitely buy uh, games to play with friends for sure. Uh, but that's, uh, and, and um, yeah, just like tangentially related, yeah, if like my friends stop playing a game, then I'll walk away from it too, you know? Like, you know, if, if I didn't have friends to play red dead online with i wouldn't play it so yeah i mean friends friends do factor into what i'm playing and how long i play a game yeah the social aspect is huge like the amount of time that we've spent screwing around in red dead i wouldn't do that alone and i wouldn't be doing that with strangers i'm doing it yeah. because we're all having a good time laughing carrying on it's just like a boy like the boys are in town and we're gonna screw around and shoot up the place you know and it's just no, for sure. I, yeah. I know I know what he's saying, and I agree. Yeah, another uh, another recent example for me and you was when we um, we tried to play that Ashen game, oh, yeah. and it had like the just really dumb co op. Uh, like it was just confusing and convoluted how you played co op with your friends or how you would like 
circumvent the way that the the developers intended for you to play, which is yeah. just to have random strangers come into your game throughout while you're playing more single player style. But it's like if you're gonna have co-op in the game, then go all in on it. Like why do we have to put in a code and then try and be in the same area in both our separate games and then maybe you'll see your friend like and then we just like said fuck this shit and bounced off at the media it's like well i can't play this with my friend i'm not gonna waste more time like figuring out how we can get this to work i'm out you know yeah and we played it for like an hour and a half trying to figure out why we couldn't see each other and it was because we weren't on the same mission and it's just yep. like why like that's not true co-op like, like, okay, yeah, you get to play together, but now there's stipulations. It's you have to have the same code entered in, and you have to be in the same part of the game to see each other. So you just kind of uh, appear in your friend's game. And, like, why can't you just let me invite the person into the game? Like, why? <laughs> it's just, oh, my God. It was just so stupid. It was so stupid. Yeah, there's there's a there's some rare uh, examples of this, you know, occasions where yeah, I mean, if you make it overly difficult for me to play your game with my friends, us to get in the game and just get going. I mean, unless it's something like I'm super invested in, like Red Dead Online or something like that, where I'll probably put up with some bullshit because I really want to play that game. Yeah, if you if you don't make it easy for me to play with my friends, like in like a Battlefield uh, has gone back and forth on this for years, like getting into a squad with your teammates and like. Sometimes you join your friend's game and it puts you on the other team and like you have to wait until the round's over to get on your team. And then it's sometimes you still have to jump through hoops to get all your people into a squad. They've, they've made it better over time, but that was always a thing that annoyed me about the Battlefield games. It was like, just let me and my friends get in a squad and play. Why is it so difficult? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So um, back in the day, we'd, we'd all play Twisted Metal 2 PC together. And we had to use like a third party uh, piece of software to get us all together to play this game. And <laughs> the game, I don't know what it was. I don't know the specifics of the behind the scenes network code and stuff. But basically, when you, everyone was trying to join the game, we had to have a join order so that everyone could get in. So if you had everyone joining at the same time, it wouldn't work. If you had, like, if you joined the game first, and I couldn't get in, it's because you were blocking me from getting in. So I had to go in before you, and then you can come in. So it turned into this like logic problem where we had to figure out who came at what point in time and had to wait a second, and this person came, then it's this person, then it's that person, in order to get everyone into, into the lobby. And it's just, it, it's weird because it's such a hassle, and it took like, five or ten minutes to figure this out maybe even more sometimes but we loved the game so much and we were all pretty good friends and it was a social thing so we all put up with that crap but other people wouldn't like a newcomer would come in and be like what is this nonsense like why can't yeah, i just I start and play i never got involved in the whole twist of metal 2 pc thing uh so i never experienced that but i was going to bring up uh another example that we both shared i don't know if you thought about this but I think the game we bounced off the hardest ever, maybe ever, was uh, Twisted Metal PS3. Yes, and like all of our all of our friends, that's probably one of the most anticipated games of my entire life. Like the lead up to that game, the hype we all had for yeah. it after Twisted Metal Black, mm -hmm. and I bounced off that game so fast and so hard. Uh, like the, everything about the single player turned me off. I didn't like the design of it. I didn't like the the weird boss fights. I didn't like. I, I thought it was maybe a little bit too difficult, um, but it was just everything about it turned me off. And then the fact that the multiplayer was just broken as shit, like, the, you know, look, just like I was saying in, in Battlefield a while ago, like getting all your friends on one team and, you know, putting together the teams and squads that you want to play together in that game seemed impossible. The, the, all kinds of network errors. And then basically you know, almost right after they released that game the studio was like well we're kind of done here we're not really going to be updating this so it's just like well i guess we're all done then and there were some people that held on you know some people that just wanted to play a twisted metal so desperately they kept playing it but that's probably one of the most disappointing experiences of my entire life and i've never bounced off a game harder than that that it, it was very disappointing i lasted two weeks so did Rody. Rody and i uh, hung out a few days after we quit basically and we both went to GameStop and traded the game in that day we were like just get just take this off of our hands 
Like I've never, yeah. I've never traded a game so fast, like gotten rid of it because I didn't even think I could like sell it to someone on like Craigslist or Kijiji or whatever and get money for it. I was like, just get rid of this piece of shit because they, they reinvented the game. They tried to make it all team based and it's like, they're saying, Oh, we listened to the player base and we're making the game they want. And it was just like, no, you didn't. You, you completely redid the whole thing and the core of the game, which is multiplayer was garbage. You could you didn't have the servers to support it or the network code or whatever. It was just day one, you shot yourselves in the foot. Day one it was shit. The the ship was sinking. It was fucked. And you guys screwed up and you like you've ruined the franchise basically with that. And it's it's funny yep. that you brought that up because I didn't think of that. But you're right. We did bounce off that really fast. Yeah. And my final uh example I wanted to bring up was um it's kind of related to mechanics and games, but the Forza racing games, I, I try to play them, uh, but my biggest issue with those games is a lack of a fast travel or it being a hidden, like later on in the game, like in, in, in that game specifically, like you have to pay in-game currency to fast travel. And I'm like, why? It doesn't make sense. And you have to like play further into the game before you even unlock the ability to do it. And then even then they don't make it easy enough like i don't i love open world games but an open world racing game just doesn't really appeal to me so i don't want to have to drive back and forth to each event i just want to get in the races and go and so while i have other issues with forza that's my biggest hang up with it and why i just i, I bounce off of it every time because like just let me get to the races and race like i don't want to drive around smashing through the billboards and dodging traffic and all that it's it's just it's just a time waster and uh so that's that's my final example of something to just like make me bounce off a game like it, but a, a counterpoint to that is like you know in red dead like fast traveling wasn't really easy in that game either like you had to go back and forth but in that game i liked that i i didn't really engage with the fast traveling too much i would rather just to get on my horse and, and go across the landscape and hunt on the way and, and stuff like that. So it's all dependent on the game, but, but yeah, the, the fast travel thing in, in the Forza series, it just completely turns me off. Yeah, I, I get that. I actually really like the Forza games. I think they're some of the best racing games out there. It is weird to have an open world racing game. I think they did a good job melding the two together, but it's not necessary. Um, I do I do agree with you though because I played it quite a bit and I did get the fast travel for Forza 4 I'm talking about. I did get the fast travel and the the price comes down after you you smash so many billboards like it gets cheaper and cheaper. I don't like that system. I do think it's stupid that you have to pay to fast travel to an event or drive to it. Like like there's enough events around that you're close enough it only takes like 30 seconds. But if you wanted to go from uh, like a different style of race where you're doing like off-roading and then you want to go do street races, those are on opposite ends of the map. So it's going to take you like five or 10 minutes to drive to the other side to get it. And it's, what's the point? You know, like you sure you can drive there and you'll do a couple of uh, like mini things like going through speed traps and, and earning some um, reputation or whatever it was called in the game or going through and doing like a drifting challenge real quick on your way there sure that stuff's there but it's not necessary so i agree yeah. i agree it's kind of stupid you should just be able to fast travel to wherever you want to go so i have one more example here and this would have been more true a couple years ago and you probably more so maybe like a decade ago but sometimes i don't play a game if there's crappy achievements or trophies, <laughs> I've become like, I think most people have become addicted to unlocking things and getting a badge to show that they've done something in a game. And that is rewarding in itself, but I've definitely either burned through games or put a game down or just been burnt out from certain achievements in games because they're either crazy and so grindy or they're, so hard to get or it's just unattainable like you have to have a hundred hours in a game to get like 10 10 uh, gamer score or like a bronze trophy or something like it's not worth it you know so yeah, I, I have well, been turned off in the past from that sort of thing yeah well you know my history with that uh, i mean i have a 
pretty pretty high gamer score is because I was an achievement whore at one point in my life and uh I used to spend way too much time caring about that stuff and grinding and playing games I didn't even want to play normally for achievements and I spent way too much time just trying like you said trying to spend all these dozens of hours just trying to get 10 gamer score uh but I left that life long behind me that's I don't even really care about achievements that much anymore I'll I'll care about them a little bit if it's like a game I really care about but yeah, I just can't be bothered. There's too many games to play. So these games are already long enough. Uh, you know, I, I just don't. Yeah, I, I don't do. I don't do that anymore. So, I, I don't know that the achievements ever really turned me off though from playing a game. I mean, I do my uh, weird OCD tick where if a game doesn't have uh, achievements that uh, keep your gamer score divisible by fives, uh, that messes with me. Like when we played Ashen and the first achievement I unlock is like for seven or 17 i'm like no it needs to be five ten or fifteen like what are you doing so that'll turn me off from playing a game if you got these weird odd numbers that are going to fuck up my perfect gamer score then i'm not going to play it <laughs> i don't get why they do that too like why yeah, why would sense. you do that why would you give me one like, yeah like i still need to go back to ashen so i can unlock one more achievement to even out that number it just it's, it's eating away at me i thought you left the life behind <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I'm just I, every time I log in, I see that number, and it's 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 not divisible by five, and it bothers me. <laughs> Don't relapse. Don't relapse, buddy. I'm gonna, have to put I'm, you gonna in I'm gonna have to calm down. I'm gonna have to <laughs> calm down. All right, so we're moving into the what the fuck we're playing this week, uh, and the first game we're gonna start out with is something me and Cynthia both played last night. Uh, which is Crackdown 3 on the Xbox One Game Pass, uh, which is really the only reason why I'm playing it, because I have a Game Pass subscription, because uh, otherwise I wouldn't play this giant pile of shit. Uh, I don't like Crackdown. I never did. I played both of them on the, on the original Xbox. The only reason Crackdown is even a thing is because Back in the day, it came with the beta to play Halo 3, and that's the only reason why anyone ever gave a shit about Crackdown. I don't know why they made a Crackdown 2. Somehow, I ended up playing that because my friends at the time were getting it, so I'm like, okay, well, I'll get it. It was co-op, and then it was basically just a retread of the first game in a lot of ways. Still crap. And then they spent all this time getting here with Crackdown 3, like it was supposed to come out uh, when when the Xbox One X launched, and here we are 15, 16 months later, and we have Crackdown 3, and it's basically exactly what you think it is. It feels like a PS2 era game, just up to 4K. It's like the gameplay is so dated and boring. I mean, it's kind of fun to jump around like and, you know, be kind of a superhero, but I feel like other games like Saints Row 3 and stuff have already kind of done this in a way. Uh, I did have fun playing it co-op with you because it's, uh, you know, the inherent insanity and stupid shit you can do, like when you're hitting me with the car and knocking my car off into the air and stuff like that and blowing me up. Like, that's, you know, that's funny shit we do in all games. But, yeah, the, the mechanics and the... Just everything about it, I'm just, I was like, no, I, I don't like anything about this game. The voice acting was bad. The, even just the vibe of it, everything they're going for, it just uh, completely turns me off. And uh, I just, uh, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think about it? You played more of the single player than I have, so you can probably speak to it better than me. Well, you got to risk it for the biscuit, agent. So, no, you so, don't. So, basically, I, I agree with you. It's a PS2 era style game. It hasn't evolved since the first Crackdown game. It just looks better. Um, I have about six or seven hours in the single player game, and it plays fine. It's just the game is just fine. Like, there's chaos, there's auto aim, there's a lot of stuff going on, uh, there's no real story. Uh, it, it's basically that, that carrot type game that we were talking about. In, in our previous segment where it's just de- defeat this sequence of events, get the next thing, level up, defeat this uh, bad guy, move on to the next one. There's another boss, whatever. It's just, there's like a carrot system to get to the end and it's open world. So there's just so much to do on top of that. There's tons of orbs to collect. Uh, there's like 20 something weapons to find and use. It's just, 
it's just a checklist. It's another game where it's just a massive checklist of things to do. And I think the developers probably thought, oh, we're going to make this open world game and it's going to be a sandbox and you can really just do whatever you want. In reality, you basically do the same shit at eight hours that you did at the very beginning, except now you can jump higher. Now you have like a different vehicle. Now you have a stronger weapon. It's just, I don't know yeah, why it, it took like- so long to develop this thing. They could have done way more with this. Yeah, but it's just like ever since Crackdown, like Crackdown 1 was kind of novel for its time. But since that time, like that was around like what, 2007-ish or something that game came out. Mm -hmm. Like open world games have changed drastically. And, you know, after coming off something like Red Dead, I mean, you got to really bring your A game with these open world games. And so playing something like Crackdown that feels so dated, it's just like, I just can't even with this. Like even uh, I, I've been dabbling a little bit here and there with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and it's like even playing that, and even that's a cool game. It's like coming after Red Dead. It's like I don't know about this. Um, and so yeah, I, I just I just can't with the with the Crackdown Three. I did um, I did load it up this morning to see the intro that you were talking about because you kept talking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's I, the I don't best know, part. What, what it, Okay, I, I guess so. Like he's talking about, I did laugh for a second when he's like, "My snake skin boots" or whatever he said, and then yeah, the the intro was kind of silly and dumb. I, I was just shaking my head the whole time, like, "What even is this game?" Okay, so uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I liked about it, and I thought it was really funny, and then it spawned a really novel storytelling idea that I think they should have went with, or at least if somebody's listening to this that's developing a game, use this in your game because it'd be amazing. So just to describe, the, this isn't a spoiler because it's literally the opening of the game. So basically what it is, is Terry Crews is the, is the face of this game. I don't know why they paid this guy to be in this game because it does nothing for the game. Literally. He has some like dialogue or whatever, like as you're playing his character, but big deal. So basically Terry Crews is like the leader of the agency and he's giving like a huge speech to everybody on their flying ship as they're going into the city to like stomp out crime. And he's saying all this stuff. He's being Terry Crews saying Terry Crews shit. And at one point he goes quack quack motherfucker because for whatever reason a duck is like their like team name or something like squad name. I don't know what it is. So he goes quack quack motherfucker and then the ship gets blown to fuck. Everybody gets vaporized on the ship. All the agents are dead. Terry Crews is dead. So my first thing is this would have been the greatest swerve or at least lately or ever if Terry Crews was the face of the game. You're going to play as him. They say you're going to play as him and he fucking dies in the cutscene in the beginning and you don't see him for the rest of the game ever again. It would be hilarious if that's what it was. <laughs> or he, at least he came back at the end of the game and he was like final boss or an unlockable. But they hype up that Terry Crews is in the game and you play it and it's going to be a Terry Crews simulator and he just dies before you even like push a button to do anything in the game. But what's end, what ends up happening is one of the characters in the game finds your like torn to shreds body and basically puts you back together again in a test tube and then you're back and you have all your powers taken away and you're really skinny and you have no no muscles or anything like that but i thought what a missed opportunity they had here to pull the rug right out from under everybody because terry cruz is on the on the front of the game he's in all the marketing he's in everything and he just gets vaporized and you never see him again i think that would have been hilarious yeah well the, the only example i know of this even though it's not a video game is have you seen deadpool 2 yeah, yeah. Where they had in the and all the marketing and the trailers beforehand, it's like him assembling this big team. And then when you watch the movie, like <laughs> on their first mission, so many of them just fucking die immediately. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was so fucking great. That was, that was so it was great. funny. It was funny. The way they the way they all handled right. that was great. It's good. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, you played a little bit of the multiplayer crackdown. I never went and touched that because I had to download that separately, which didn't make sense to me. But what did you think of the the multiplayer? Okay, I played it for ten minutes. Um, I think it took longer to download. It is shit. It is another prime example of a game throwing in multiplayer when it has no business to do so. There's no reason for this game to have multiplayer. And I think the only reason why they added it is because if some people remember uh, what Crackdown was known for was it was going to use the cloud to process all this destruction. 
all like you can blow up anything all the buildings would be blowing up and all these pieces would be flying everywhere just total chaos the single player doesn't have that the multiplayer co-op doesn't have it thank god because it runs like shit without all that crazy stuff going on but the wrecking zone which is what the multiplayer uh, version is called the wrecking zone has all that um destruction in it but it's it's really scaled down so there's two modes there's a capture the point style game where you have like a b c d points and you get points for capturing them and and holding on to them and then there's another mode called manhunt which is basically someone is like the person to hunt down and you get points for killing them or whatever and the levels themselves i would describe them as they're basically cardboard set pieces of like the tron movies So basically everything is destructible. So it's just like all these like wafer thin walls and stuff, but everything is outlined in neon lights. So it just, it looks like a training room. You know what I mean? And you're just fighting in this like neon training room and walls are collapsing and pillars are collapsing and everyone has auto aim. So they're just, they're shooting you from across, jumping, jumping around, dashing, doing all these things and just always hitting you with whatever they're shooting at you. And it's just... Can you it's get can you get killed by the destruction? Can you get no. like, killed by a building? No, you would just fall. You would just fall down and hit the ground. Well, so and well, then what's damage. the point of the destruction? Other I don't than know. Just have it in there. I don't know. Yeah, it, I mean that's the only. I mean I like games that have destruction elements like that, like you know, like Red Faction and stuff. Yeah. So I feel like I still kind of wanted to see what it looks like. It's not and, impressive. You know, like I said, they, it's not. Yeah, impressive. they hyped it up. Yeah, they hyped it up for so long, and like I said, I was kind of looking forward to that aspect of the game because i don't know why more developers don't have a sort of red faction destruction element to it it's such a unique thing and uh it sucks that i guess i guess they didn't really use that to any great effect no like it doesn't have like terraforming or anything like where like the ground you can you put craters in the ground and stuff like that it's basically like if you were to drive a car into a cement wall and the cement wall breaks apart that's all it does. It's just everything is walls and pillars. It falls down. It blows up. It's, I don't know. It's just, again, why is this even in the game? It's just so half-ass. Like, people yeah. are going to be playing Fortnite and other games. You know what I mean? You're not going to take a piece of that pie. Don't even bother with this stuff. And I felt that way with, like, the Doom reboot. And I love Doom, but the multiplayer, like, how many people are really going to play the multiplayer in it? You know, like, a, yeah. maybe diehard fans? And it'd be like thirty it, people. It's it's still a, a leftover relic from last generation where people have to they feel like they have to put a multiplayer mode because they want to keep people playing the game. They don't want them to move on to something else or trade it in. They want that engagement, so they just throw this shit in there. I just I wonder what the numbers are like, like like the retention numbers. Like, do people play this game beyond the first month? You know, because, yeah, because like everything's a, dead. Everything's dead after it, that. It was like I was saying last night, though, where uh, the only people playing it are people like us that are downloading it free on Game Pass and just, let me see what this multiplayer thing is. I I doubt anyone's, like, taking it serious, you know? Yeah, it's, I would say um, Sea of Thieves is probably like that, too. Like, I can't see that having a huge player base anymore. I mean, there are some people that play it, but, you know, yeah, it can't have that much of a player base. Uh, Is there anything else you want to add to Crackdown before we move on? No, I, I would say single player, it's fine. Um, the games it's competing against, like Saints Row, and I would say closely to Sunset Overdrive, it, it cannot compare. Like Sunset Overdrive is like way thousand times better. It's fun. It's over the top. It does all like the cheeky swearing, storytelling stuff way better than Crackdown does. Saints Row does it better too because Saints Row is self-aware. It's just, it's just a shame. Yeah, It's just a shame. Like why yeah, like, like, this game didn't need to Sunset, exist. Sunset Overdrive is a is a solid title. I had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, so did I. Like it had me laughing and like at first for that game, it took me a second to get into it because I didn't really understand the like grinding on everything Tony Hawk style gameplay. But once you got into it, it was it was a really innovative, fun game. And that's that's where this genre should be going. Like the crackdown over the top Saints Row crazy superhero type stuff should be going that way like innovative so uh talking about multiplayer games i'm just going to talk briefly uh uh, give a give a apex legends update 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about it too long this week, <clears throat> but I did play more of it. Uh, some friends invited me to play on Xbox the other night. Uh, I'd been playing it on PC, so I joined them, got my first ever win right out of the gate. Uh, so we won, so I feel good. Even if I retire from Apex, at least I got one win in. Uh, but it's a little bit different experience playing it on Xbox. It took me a second to get into playing it on a controller because I'd been playing on PC, and uh, I, I definitely felt like I had more of a fighting chance on uh, on on the Xbox. I was definitely able to get out there and get some more kills because <clears throat> you don't have all your uh, you know headshot wizards like you do on PC, and that's that's where the the real competition is for the most part. So I, I got to engage a little bit more, uh, explore the mechanics and systems in that game a little bit more. And then I played again a couple nights ago with some other with another group of friends on PC, and then again just got completely wrecked all night, just completely demoralized. Uh, that's one of the most demoralizing games I've ever played in my entire life. Uh, so, but <clears throat> yeah, it's it's still good. Apex Legends, uh, I love it. I'm still gonna probably mess around with it a little bit more. I don't have anything really new to add other than. I'm still playing it. It's still fun, and uh, I think it's a great game that everybody should check out. Um, and then the final thing I want to talk about is Metro Exodus. Um, now, this was on my most anticipated games of 2019 list from last week, uh, and so I picked that up this week. Um, and uh, so I got it on on the on the on the uh, Epic uh, Epic Store, the Epic Launcher. Uh, so this is my first experience with that. And um, I, I really didn't take into consideration all the sort of uh, things along the periphery that I took for granted that I like from Steam, like, you know, the, the ability to be able to hit shift tab and, and bring up the Steam overlay and the fact that Steam has its own built in, you know, FPS counter so I can check my frames per second while I'm playing a game or the ability to even take a screenshot, you know, because I love taking screenshots of games. And so while Metro has its own photo mode, you really can't do anything with it because you can't like hit, hit F12 to take a screenshot. So I was once I got kind of in the mix of it there, I was a little bit disappointed because I'm like, well, these are things I just wasn't even considering before playing this game that I wouldn't be able to, you know, take screenshots and all this other stuff. So while the, the Epic Launcher is fine in and of itself, it's like I'm not going to be playing any more games on there until they add the features that we all expect from pc gaming that steam has but getting into the game itself um my, i it was i got off to a rough start with it uh because my first two hours were spent troubleshooting the game because it kept crashing on me um and i couldn't understand why because i could play it for about 10 15 minutes and then either my either the game would just crash out the desktop or my computer would just completely lock up and so i eventually figured out it was just one setting the game set to run uh, in DirectX 12 by default, and so apparently, if you're having those crashes, you need to set it to DirectX 11. And once I did that, it was smooth sailing. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as the game itself, um, I mean, I'm not super super far into it, but uh, what I have played so far, I definitely like. Um, my uh, just talking about it from from a technical ass point uh, or aspect, it, it's you know, the Metro games have always been like uh, games that will bring your computer to their knees. And so I was almost even not even thinking about getting this on PC because my computer is no spring chicken, even though I've updated it a lot uh, and I'm able to play it. Uh, I almost wanted to get it on Xbox just so I could have a good, nice, solid experience without worrying about technical difficulties. Uh, but it's pretty well optimized, uh, although I am a little bit concerned that it's not it wasn't made PC first. It, it almost feels there's certain things about it that make it feel like it was maybe made on consoles first and then ported to PC because it doesn't have a lot of the options that you would normally see as far as graphical options and stuff like that. Uh, and, and even when I first started playing the game, uh, the the beginning of the game is very scripted and more action oriented in a way. And it almost felt like a Call of Duty campaign or something. So I was a little bit like, I don't, I don't know about this. Um, but once you once you get into the meat of the game, once you get past the first section and you kind of see what they're going for, uh, you get dumped out into your first uh, open area. Now, this game is an open world, but they do have these like sort of uh, like hub biomes almost in a way where it's a little bit more open. You can explore and go out and do little 
side quest and, and go off the beaten path. Um, and so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm kind of of two minds about that where we already have enough open world games and I sort of come to Metro as this old school, like linear, just corridor shooter. Like just, you know, I just want to go from point A to point B. I don't want to get bogged down with exploring a huge map and all this other stuff. And while that stuff is fun, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take away from the game. I'm actually liking that element of it. But uh, yeah, like I said, I'm of two minds because it's like, well, I mean, I don't need these longer games. Like, just give me a shooter campaign that I can beat in like 10 to 15 or maybe 15 to 20 hours, please. Uh, and I guess if you were to stay on point uh, going, you know, just from point A to point B and ignoring all the open worldiness of it, you can you can probably still have that experience. But uh, no, overall, it's good. Uh, it, it runs pretty good. I was able to. Uh, it, it definitely wasn't bringing my computer to its knees, which, like I said, it made me question whether it was actually made on PC first. Um, but <clears throat> it doesn't. Uh, I'm not playing it with all the new bells and whistles. I don't have the 2080 card in my computer, so I'm not able to do all the ray tracing stuff and all that. So I'm not playing it on like ultra settings with all the cool shit on. Uh, but it's even then, it still looks really great. Graphically, it's really awesome. Uh, I still love the creature designs. I think they look super cool. Uh, like a lot of games, they have like cool creature designs in their um, in their concept art, but it doesn't really look that great in game. But their creature designs look really cool. Um, I'm getting some like kind of Far Cry Two vibes from this game. Uh, it has like that map system, like in Far Cry Two, where you gotta actually bring up a physical map in your hand and look at it in game. Uh, so you don't have this like uh, map that you basically back up into, um, and then uh, there's a little bit of elements of like uh, like The Last of Us in there. Like you have this backpack that you carry around with you, and you got some, you pick up like resources throughout the environment uh, that you can use to like craft little things like health packs and stuff like that. So it has that kind of Last of Us vibe where you can like just craft things on the fly. Uh, thankfully the whole resource management in the game is not that crazy i'm glad it's just a few different things that you manage and you use those resources to basically craft everything like ammo and stuff like that um which uh so the the fact that it's a open worldy more open worldy type game now it, it kind of breaks one of the things that i liked about the uh economy of the other games which is that like bullets or ammo and it had this very tight um you know survival horror element to it where it's like you all you just barely got through a level with a few bullets left in the chamber uh and and this they let you craft ammo and stuff like that so and, and the fact that you can you know explore and go back and forth through the world they had to make it where you know there's not just a, a set amount of ammo in every level so they did give you the ability to to craft ammo and stuff like that i mean you still get pretty low a lot of times um, especially once you scour a landscape and you've kind of pulled all the resources that you can find, uh, you do. You, so eventually you have to start, you know, kind of bypassing enemies as much as possible, uh, especially the creatures, because they kind of respawn into the level. So it's not like you could just go through and clear out an area and not have to worry about it. If you come back through, uh, the, the, the creature uh, enemies will, will repopulate. So that's a little bit annoying because, uh, you know, you, you end up having to like try to stealth past them a lot of times. Um, I mean, I, I would say, uh, I would say my biggest, uh, complaint about the game is, uh, the human AI is particularly weak here. I don't think they, they're not very smart and they just kind of run from different parts of cover and they don't really come in on you or flank you too much. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed with that a little bit. The creature AI is fine because, you know, they're creatures. They usually just run right at you. Um, and then, uh, but this game does commit uh, a cardinal sin of PC gaming, which is uh, only having one save slot. Now, the game uh, has a checkpoint system where it saves, you know, in the background all the time, or you can hit F5 to do your one save. Uh, but it sucks because you can't, like, go back. You know, you can't have multiple saves if you want to go back to something. Uh, so that kind of sucks a little bit. And, you know, you could potentially get in a situation where the game saves it right before you fall off a cliff or something like that. And so you, spawn in and fall and die fall and die i mean it's, it's probably gonna be super rare that that happens but it could happen uh so if you did ha if you hadn't did your hard save lately uh you could really screw yourself or have to go back a little while but um 
Yeah, so far though, I mean, I, I'm really enjoying it. It's pretty much what I wanted it to be. Um, I mean, it's not really, it's not blowing my socks off like I thought maybe it would. Um, it, it's you know, uh, gaming is changing super rapidly, and and expectations change. It feels like almost month to month at this point, but the game so far seems to be delivering on on what I wanted for the most part. And um, you know, I just got to play more of it and get to the different biomes, the different parts of the game. I don't know how long it's going to be, but yeah, I kind of want to see uh, a little bit more of it. But so far, it's uh, it's living up to my expectations for the most part, and I think it's a pretty solid game. So so people should check it out. It's uh, like I said, it's Metro Exodus. It's available on PC, uh, Xbox, and PlayStation Four. Are you going to play it on the Xbox or anything just to see what it looks like or how it plays differently? Because you're saying that it sounds like it was developed for the console first. Yeah, well, because like my only experience with the... Because I've never played... Because they have uh, Redux, the Metro Last Light Redux and 2033 Redux on Game Pass, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I've never I've never tried them. I've always wanted to see how it felt. I just remember my first experience with Metro on a console was... Uh, I picked up 2033 on on the Xbox 360 back in the day, and I stopped playing that game within like an hour because it just felt so awful. And uh, I, I just thought it was a bad game. It wasn't until I got a gaming PC about six years ago, and then I, I downloaded it again. And then I was like, oh, playing this on PC is a completely different ball game. So maybe I'll check it out on the console at some point. That's not anything that I'm really thinking about doing anytime soon. So I don't have any point of reference. Like, I'm sure... Last Light in 2033 play better on the Xbox One than uh, you know they did on the 360, but I don't really know, so I can't really I can't really speak to that too much. Okay, let's do some questions and answers. And just to all the listeners out there, if you have any questions you want to ask or have an interesting topic that you want to pitch or want to be part of the show, send us an email at bastardsgamingnetwork at gmail.com or just message us on our Bastards of Gaming Facebook group. All right. So uh, first question this week uh, is from Mex going to give it to you. And he writes, uh, what are your thoughts on Microsoft calling for unification across the video game landscape. Now, I saw this in passing, but I don't really know much about uh, what this is in reference to specifically. So why don't you go ahead and take the lead on this one? So basically, Microsoft is just saying that there should be more like cross-pollination, more cooperation between the companies. And basically, they're saying like Microsoft, Sony, and, and Nintendo. And Sony actually came out and said like, hey, it sounds like a great idea. Whether or not that goes anywhere, who knows? It would be interesting to me to see if it does go anywhere. I don't know if it it means um, they're going to be developing a system together. It could just mean like they might stop with the exclusivity of things, or they could like allow Xbox Live to run their app on like Sony's PlayStation Store and it'll play on the PS4 or whatever and it can see their friends. Like maybe that's what they mean, where they'll be more friendly toward each other and let the competitors have certain things on their storefronts and let their player base use those things. Maybe that's what it means, especially in light of Microsoft saying that Xbox Live is going to move to Android and iOS and all this other stuff. So it's it's interesting. Um, thinking about it from a marketing perspective, competition keeps everyone on their A game, keeps them on their toes. It makes everybody produce uh, top-notch stuff. So I don't know if... Like, we don't know how far this is going to go. We don't know how how unified they really want to make this if it's going to even go anywhere this could just be a thought it could be another 20 years before we see anything really culminate from this but it's it's an interesting thing to to hear and to hear competitors say like oh yeah maybe maybe we should cooperate on something or collaborate or whatever it is they're thinking i think it's it's an interesting concept yeah i don't really know um <clears throat> I would need to know more of the intent behind uh, wh- what this person meant by this because, I mean, it could mean a multitude of things. It could mean, I don't know, does uh, does 343 Studios team up with Naughty Dog and make a game? Or, or does that mean, 
our streaming service or Game Pass will be on, a, you know, a PlayStation console or a Nintendo console. Or does it mean they're sharing resources? I mean, it can mean a bunch of different things. Um, is it, you know, is, is it the the cross platform stuff? Uh, you know, it's it's hard to say what this person's intent was because I don't really know. I didn't really read any articles based on it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, sure, uh, more cooperation and 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 that kind of thing is is ultimately gonna is ultimately going to benefit um, everyone, uh, you know, as the saying goes, uh, rising tide raises all boats. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would, I would like to see more of that happening, but like I said, I don't know specifically what they mean or what the intent is, but, you know, Microsoft has this, it seems like, you know, they're reaching out their hand to everyone these days and, and the, and they want to, uh, you know, instead of being ultra competitive and, you know, uh, basically being like, uh, you know, everyone is the enemy. You know, if we we can't have people buying PlayStation, we want them buying Xbox. It seems like a little bit of that is dying, but yet it clashes with like you know normal uh, the normal mentality, business mentality of like we're we're competing against other people in our field, and we have to be the best. And and like you said, it keeps everyone on their toes. It keeps everyone competitive. I mean, that's certainly the reason why. Uh, you know, Microsoft had to be humbled this generation by some stupid decisions they made at the beginning when they revealed the Xbox One. So, uh, and, and and they've had to like make up ground uh, since then. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would like to see more of that. Yeah, the articles didn't really give too much context to what they really meant. The ones that I read anyway, maybe there has been some uh, more articles that are uh, more in depth now, but I, I haven't seen any. So it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say what they actually mean by this. It could just be nothing. <laughs> yeah. All right. So next question is from Imagine Dragoons, who asks, is Xbox Game Pass worth it? Uh well, yeah, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a hard question to to answer in in, in a certain way because it all depends on what you kind of want out of it or what you're what you're really doing on your Xbox. Um you know, I mean, to break it down to the most fundamental level, if you think about it, you're paying ten dollars a month, and you get access to all of Microsoft's per- first-party titles. Uh, so the new Halo, the new Gears, the new like we played Crackdown. You know, I, I certainly would have wouldn't have bought that myself. Uh, so it, it allows engagement for games that maybe you wouldn't buy, but you could you can break it down as like, you know, for basically the cost of two AAA titles a year. Uh, you can play all their games and then all these third party games and they're constantly swapping them out and they have some old 360 games on there. And another cool feature is that you can play those games on PC as well. So if you want to play, uh, you know, Gears 4 on PC or on your Xbox, you have that option. And uh, usually with single player games, you can, you know, I can be playing Gears 4 co-op on my PC with my friend who's on Xbox. Uh, sometimes they silo you off uh, to different servers. If, if you're talking about competitive multiplayer games, they usually don't let, you know, keyboard and mouse players play with the controller guys. Um, but if, as far as single player games or co-op games, it doesn't seem to matter. So there's a lot of benefit to that. I mean, I was kind of hesitant in that I usually buy all the first party games, I, I still like buying physical things. So I, I would be the type of person that would show up day one to buy Gears 4 or Halo and get the collector's edition and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I ended up getting Game Pass last year when Sea of Thieves came out and then State of Decay and all that because I'm like, well, it's kind of difficult to convince all your friends to like buy something that you don't know how good it is. Like with when we played Sea of Thieves last year, the only reason why we played that is because it was on Game Pass and we could all just download it for basically ten dollars a month. It was a dollar. Um, they had it yeah, yeah, at that yeah, at that time, yeah, it was. So, you know, stuff like that's worthwhile. Where maybe you want your friends to play a game, and you know, you can't really convince them to plop down sixty dollars on something. But if it's free on the Game Pass, you might as well. So, I've been subscribed for about ten months now. I've I've been pretty happy with it. It allowed us to play some games that. I probably never would have played. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, you get the entire Microsoft first party library, even going back to 360. Uh, some of those games don't work on PC, though, like old 360 games that were never made on PC won't work on PC. But yeah, overall, I mean, I think it's a 
I think it's a worthwhile thing. It just it depends on how much you care about you know Microsoft's first party games or how many of those you think you might actually buy. Because for me, I'm I'm probably going to buy two or three of them a, a year anyway, if not more. So I mean, you're literally saving money at that point. Uh, so what do you think about it? Okay, for me, it's been 100 percent worth it. I've got my money's worth, like for sh- like absolutely 100 percent got my money's worth, and. Like it's not just the first party games because they released it. They released um, the new Tomb Raider this past month, and I haven't played that yet. And that only came out in like November. And I know I think you bought it like day one because you love Tomb Raider. Yeah, it kind of sucks when you see stuff like that, but yeah. that's the that's the price you pay when you buy games day one now. And that's yeah. and that's pretty a pretty fast turnaround because it's kind of like Netflix, where Netflix doesn't get the latest releases for like six or seven months. And like, what is that? That's like four and a half, almost five months. Tomb Raider, boom, is on the Game Pass for ten dollars, and it's and it's yep. not the only game that's great on there. Like, there's a lot of games, and I and I've played a ton of them. Like, there's games I'll never play, like older 360 games I've played once before. I wouldn't play those. And then there's a ton of indie games that I'm not really interested in. But there's been so many games that I have been interested in, either pre-ordered because it was like a a physical release or I was going to buy it digitally like um like a smaller game like like um two crowns or whatever and it ends up going on to the game pass and I don't even need to buy it because I've already subscribed to it so I've saved a lot of money that way and it's also like you said it's a good it's a good way to find games to play with friends without anybody really committing you know so like Sea of Thieves definitely was a great I a great uh game to get off of that because we were unsure if it was going to be good or not and the game the game's fine it's just there's it's bare bones it's not what it should be but it's like we had our fun with it for like a week or so and and then we moved on from it and like we we all got gears 4 when it first came out but it's on game pass so people who haven't played it yet can all get their buddies on there and play horde mode or pvp or whatever and forza i I really like forza 3 and then i pre-ordered forza 4 and then when the Game Pass thing came out, I canceled my pre-order and just got Forza 4 on the Game Pass for basically nothing. And I played that for 30, 40 hours. You know, so it's definitely worth it. I, I'm interested in the behind-the-scenes money aspect of it. Like, how much do developers get paid to have their games on there? And I'm pretty sure they get a lump sum to be on it. It's not like... Like only 10 people downloaded and played your game this month. So you're getting this much in royalties or whatever. I think it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the biggest mystery to this whole thing. It's, it's, it's kind of like the free games that you get every month with PlayStation Plus and Xbox mm. Live. And it's like, how do you offer that? Like, uh, there's obviously some back end compensation. So I'm wondering if it works like, um, maybe it's based on the amount of downloads or people that engage with it. Like how, how much that would translate to normal sales and then they give them like a reasonably close amount of money or if maybe it's a deal up front, like it's we'll give that. you this much more. Yeah, it, it's hard to say. I mean, it, no one really knows. Everyone's been trying to uh, figure out the answer to this question. But in the case of like a Game Pass, though, what's insane about it is you get their first party AAA $60 games for $10 a month. And like I just don't see how that's worthwhile. I yeah. can see... Some of these little smaller games that maybe like wouldn't you know you might overlook them if you're looking through the store, but yeah, the, having their triple A first party titles on the service is just insane to me. It is it is kind of crazy. Like day one, if they put it on later, like they did with Tomb Raider, then at least everybody at the beginning bought the game full price, played it, whatever. Now it's like the second wave, third wave of people who were maybe on the fence or just haven't gotten to it yet. Now they can get it on Game Pass. But day one, offering your game for basically nothing, I have no idea how they're making money off that. Because now people are people are going to expect that. They're going to expect a game to end up on Game Pass or to be part of that month's uh, gold or plus membership for free. You know, we're being trained to like wait it out because they're going to give us this indie game one day and I don't want to drop 20 bucks or buy it for $10 when it's on sale. I'm going to get it for free one day and I can wait. You know what I mean? Yeah, like we're being trained. It, yeah, and it's crazy because with this, I mean, it's not like the game will be on there for a little while. Like sometimes on Netflix, like certain movies will be on there for a few months and then they take it off. Like their first party titles are on there permanently all the time. So there's literally 
no reason to ever buy to go to a GameStop or Amazon or whatever to buy a first party game if you have Game Pass. And that's that's just insane to me. Like, why would you ever spend sixty dollars at that point? Uh, that's I, I, yeah, I just don't because you know the third party games and some of the smaller games like they take games off and put games on. So you know, like I was wanting to go back and mess around with that Zombie Army trilogy that we were playing uh, a while back, and but they've already taken that off there. So if I wanted to play that game again i would have to buy it so it's just crazy that you literally don't have to buy the first party xbox games um or microsoft studios games if you know you have game pass well they have that like you get it you get a certain amount off if you buy it while it's on game pass and i don't know Mm, i I wonder if like how many people actually do do that because like what game do you want to actually own after it's off game pass yeah. it's been on there for well, like, six months you know what i mean yeah like i said I'm, I'm i'm a struggle with that because i still like to buy physical copies of of games i like having the i like having the case and putting it on my shelf and putting them all in alphabetical order and all that stuff because I'm, I'm still one of those guys so it's gonna it's, they're, they're breaking me of it slowly but surely uh, but yeah that's that, that's the only other thing because like i said if they come out with a uh, well, well, Halo Five was kind of the perfect example. This was a little bit before Game Pass, but I bought the collector's edition of of Halo Five because I always like the little statues and everything they come with. And but the the collector's edition just came with a digital copy of the game, so I didn't even actually get uh, the physical copy. So I imagine if you had like a Halo, uh, the next Halo game, Halo Infinite, or whatever, if they have a collector's edition for that, it's probably just going to be all the collector stuff. And you'll just play the game on Game Pass. I, ex- I I expect. I don't know. Yeah, Game Pass is really interesting. I I thought it was interesting when I first announced it, and I'm still fascinated by it today. Yeah, because I wonder if this forces other other companies to do this. I mean, we're all going toward a streaming future. Um, all these companies like Ubisoft and Sony has had the PlayStation Now, and Microsoft said they're working on their own streaming service. I played that. Google, uh, I forget what it's called, that Google thing a couple months ago with Assassin's Creed. Uh, So, you know, everything's moving in a streaming direction, but I wonder if this makes, you know, Sony be like, well, we're going to have to have something like Game Pass on on the PlayStation 5, you know? All right. uh, So the last question of the day comes from uh, Sadly Testy Raphael asks, if you could fuck any uh, game console, which one would you bone? Um, so I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you start on that. Uh, I I think I would pick the Switch, simply because I would buy the Nintendo Labo, and I would create some sort of like cardboard sex doll, mm, and a, then okay. and then incorporate the Switch into that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I was thinking it's, the practicality, uh, like the practicality of having sex with a box, it, it doesn't really work. You know, you need you need something to kind of have weight so you can feel the weight on your body and you hold it. So the Labo, I think, would be perfect for yeah, plus the, the thing. Plus, uh, yeah, plus the, the, the Joy-Cons have the HD rumble, so <laughs> you, get, you get that good vibration in there. <laughs> That's true. I didn't think of that. Yeah, that'd, that'd, be, pretty, that'd be pretty good. That'd be pretty good. What about you? Uh, well, I mean, this is complicated for me. I mean, I think, I think back to like, you know, the Dreamcast that was like sort of my first experience with thinking about video game consoles in a sexual manner because that was the first console that you could browse the internet and look at porn on. So I have this, (laughs) you know, that was kind of like my first, my first experience with thinking about uh, video game consoles in a sexual way. But I don't know. It's it's kind of difficult. I mean, because like like you know, I thought about the Switch too. I mean, you know, you can pull those little Joy Cons off and insert them wherever you want to insert them. The HD Rumble feels pretty good. Um, but you know, then I mean, the PlayStation Four. If if you have like the you know VR stuff with the wand controllers, I mean, you know, those those could achieve the same effect. I mean, you could shove those up your ass, and that'd probably be all right. Um, but, you know, as far as the console itself, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I feel like the 360 is just my love. I mean, that's just like my favorite console of all time. I have so many memories with that. And I just think if I could fuck a console and just really make sweet, passionate love to it, I mean, I feel like I would just have to go with the 360 just because, 
I mean, that's the one I care about the most. You know, I've had some flings with these other consoles, but, you know, the 360 really has my heart. So if I could fuck a video game console, it'd definitely be the 360. So it wouldn't be like one of the old nasty broads, like a Jaguar or like a Dreamcast or something? No, nah, that shit's that shit's dried up and and old at this point. You know, old 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 consoles are old. I don't I don't want that. I don't want that old old console pussy. I want that new sweet. You know, sort of around my age. You know, someone that's like in their thirties. You know what I mean? Like the you know the Xbox three hundred and sixty. You know, it's it, it's no spring chicken, but it's not some old retro bullshit either. And so I feel like, you know, the 360 probably knows what it wants at this point. It's probably going to be a, a good, passionate lover. Uh, so I just feel like that probably, you know, fits into my age range and my overall view of everything. And like I said, I'd rather just make sweet love to someone I care about, and that's the 360. Well, I'm a family man, so that's why I'm going with Nintendo. It's just mm, it's the more, like, family-oriented type thing. Yeah. You know, I'll be, I'll be taken care of and I know I don't have to worry about my kids walking in on us or anything like that, you know? Yeah, I got you. So thank you to all the listeners out there for joining us this week and in previous weeks. If you haven't already, please visit our Facebook page and YouTube pages. You can get clips of the show. You can get full episodes. You get gaming videos that we're starting to put up of us playing together and other special things that we're not going to really talk about on the podcast. So get out there, subscribe, like, engage with us. We love talking with with fans and discussing things. We really want people to engage with us and we want to include people on the show and give them shout outs and to make sure that their voice is also heard because we want to really build this out into like a community thing for older gamers that just love gaming have been gaming for so long and just love talking about it as much as we do so please engage like share and subscribe and until next time peace peace Oh my god, it's so fucking hot in this closet. So how how big of a closet are we talking about that you're in here, R. Kelly? <laughs> it's like maybe eight by eight. And I'm surrounded by my clothes and my wife's clothes. But mm, the, the sound that's... the sound is amazing in here. Like it's it's ma- mainly soundproof. So you're not gonna hear my kid and wife watching Teen Mom downstairs or something. This is like this is it. But it's so hot in here. Like I am sweating almost from sitting but you live in canada i don't it shouldn't be cool like what do you got the heat cranked up <laughs> yeah because it's pretty cold outside wait you think i can like live in minus 50 degree weather like uh, why don't you just strip down i don't understand yeah i'm gonna walk around like fucking sasquatch yeah i just like I, you know i, I want to picture you uh you know just in your underwear doing this podcast so i think it's just kind of beautiful <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't stop it immediately and be like, God damn, this guy's ugly as shit. Well, I mean, I don't know if some of these people have seen you, but you're a fucking sexy beast. I mean You know what? I always tell people I look like uh you're you're a Bill and Ted fan. So in the second Bill and Ted, the bogus adventure, there's those stations, those like hairy fucking yeah. ugly things. I that's what I look like. <laughs> I look like one of those. I don't have the nose, but like my body where I'm just like this round mass of hair. And like no yeah. ass, like my, my back just goes straight into my ass and it doesn't stick out and it just goes straight into my legs. I remember that story on TMA that you posted one time where your, your fucking ass hairs got so matted up one time <laughs> that you had to like, you had to go in there and like surgically fucking get that shit open so you could take a shit or something. No, it Wasn't was. that story you told on there? <laughs> that was, I was in Florida and I went into the ocean when it was like, just, like a storm just passed and the waves were like six feet tall. And a wave literally tackled me to the ocean floor and dragged me like a few feet. So I just got all the broken seashells and rocks in my chest hair and everything else. And I stood up and it was, I was just covered in it. Like I looked like I just came out of fucking Davy Jones's locker from Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> and like, <laughs> like with barnacles on my face and shit. And that night when I went to the bathroom, there was broken seashells and stuff literally in the crack of my ass and i and i had i had i didn't even know i didn't even feel it so i had to like have a shower to get it all out it was ridiculous that's how hairy i am i'm not robin williams hairy i'm a nice hairy like it sits down and i can kind of comb my arm hair and shit but it's 
it'll trap shit in there like a lobster. It'll trap a fucking lobster in my chest hair. Yeah. It'd be funny if you're just taking a shower and all of a sudden this fucking jellyfish just falls off your ass. <laughs> <laughs>